RED140 is the most anabolic of all, you know, has an anabolic to androgenic rating of 90 to one, when in reality, that is just a statistic pulled out of somebody's ass for a YouTube video, probably. What's up guys, Derek, moreplates.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about the most hair safe SARMs. So this is a popular request um, sort of as a follow-up to my most hair safe uh, steroids video I just put out the other day. Um, a lot of requests for the SARMs version of that. So in SARMs, there's not really like a family tree. Like I guess you could technically split them up into steroidal SARMs and non-steroidal SARMs. Um, and SARMs, by the way, if you don't already know, stand for Selective Androgen Receptor Modulator, and they were essentially designed to be more tissue selective than testosterone, as well as its synthetic derivatives that were created, formerly known as anabolic androgenic steroids. So it was, the attempt was to make an anabolic that is uh, more tissue selective than every single anabolic steroid ever created, so then it could be used in a clinical setting on uh, women, children, you know, anything, essentially, anyone or anything, regardless of gender, blah, blah, blah. And because, you know, obviously deploying something like Anadrol for, uh, you know, somebody who is, uh, has some sort of muscle wasting and or, you know, whatever it's being applied for is problematic when you have a compound with inherent androgenicity that can cause masculinization. So obviously we're not going to, uh, you know, the ideal situation would be to not viralize a bunch of women, rather it would be to put them on a tissue selective androgen receptor modulator, which would then bind to the AR, transcribe anabolic effects in tissue, muscle tissue and bone ideally only, and then leave pretty much everything the fuck alone. Everything else alone, which in practical application, have they been able to do that? Not quite, but you know, some of the compounds are pretty promising in the pipeline for the intended use for which they were designed. And this has led to many, many individuals, you know, deploying this for performance enhancement, as well as, uh, I guess, people seeking less androgenic side effects or don't wanna inject stuff or just wanna buy something readily available or, you know, a myriad of different reasons have led to people starting to implement SARMs into their bodybuilding, sports enhancement, et cetera, regimens. And people are finding out pretty quick some of these SARMs cause these same androgenic side effects and shut you down just as aggressively, or at least pretty fucking close in some cases. So as far as the androgenic activity though, is that actually the SARM? And if so, which ones are the most hair safe? So the first thing that needs to be elucidated is the fact that some of these SARMs in development that have been stated to be, you know, oh, this is an, like RED140 is the most anabolic of all, you know, has an anabolic to androgenic rating of 90 to one, when in reality, that is just a statistic pulled out of somebody's ass for a YouTube video, probably. I have not seen that uh, in the literature anywhere, and I have read every single study done on this compound, and that is what led me to, uh, you know, my first post in my article on my website where I basically said, where the fuck did this come from? Because it's definitely not the case. So is it 90 to one? Like, no, it's not. In fact, it is one of the most androgenic SARMs there are. And it's even, one of its noted side effects is even aggression, like a fucking pre-workout response you would get from like a heavy duty adrenergic response from something like Anadrol or something. So, you know, people are like reporting like fucking mild halo testin like aggression from this shit as if it is, you know, something heavily androgenic. So does that mean it's 90 to one? Certainly not. Um, but something often overlooked is that sometimes with these SARMs, they'll cause androgenic alopecia or telogen effluvium in some cases. Some cases it's misinterpreted as the compound is not tissue selective and it's super androgenic, but what is often overlooked is the fact that these SARMs are horrible on crushing your SHBG, similar to oral steroids, realistically, like very aggressive on driving your SHBG down as far down as the single digits. I've seen numerous blood work results at this point showing single digit SHBG levels during the middle of the, like the peak of a SARM cycle. And as you would expect, this creates a disproportionately androgenic environment in the body if you have any endogenous testosterone being produced, which for some SARMs, you know, 
you'll be like borderline shut down. But for some SARMs, you're not. And this can create, you know, and when you start it, it's not like you're shut down off the bat. You will eventually have um, the suppression of testosterone production. However, you know, there is a process to getting to that point. And during that point, you're going to end up in a position where your SHBG, SHBG is being driven down. And coincidentally, what is the androgen with the highest binding affinity for SHBG? You know, oftentimes it's thought to be testosterone. You know, testosterone is the thing that gets bound up by SHBG and SHBG is the devil because it's stealing all our tests. When in reality, it's not. It like it does hold your test, but it's not the devil. And something often overlooked is that DHT has the highest binding affinity for SHBG. It's like fivefold higher than testosterone. So this is partially why you have this inverted looking binding protein profile in women versus men. You have women with high estrogen levels, high binding proteins, and they have a disproportionately different free androgen index than a male. And they obviously just produce less to begin with as well. So not only do they produce, you know, like whatever, 10 times less androgens or whatever it is, but they also have far more binding proteins to, you know, bind up the DHT and testosterone and notably the DHT to a significantly greater extent because it has that much greater of an affinity to bind to SHBG. So when you crush your SHBG with a SARM and you're not, you know, fucking shut down as hell and you still have testosterone going around in your system, what's that do? Not only are you competing for the androgen receptor and then knocking more preventing tests from binding and perhaps increasing 5-alpha reduction into DHT. But above and beyond that, your binding proteins are lower. So now you have more free-flowing DHT just going off like a geyser in your fucking body. And it makes it a more dominantly androgenic environment. So is it the SARM itself that is androgenic? In some cases, but in some cases, it is just the hormone profile induced by the user's implementation of XSARM. And this is sort of uh, where you get into the weeds of how do you even determine what a SARM's tissue selectivity is to begin with then? Well, that's where you would have to realistically like experiment with a SARM plus estrogen only and have yourself completely shut down with nothing else interfering. Cause that is the only way to assess exactly what's going on. Is anyone gonna do that? No, except me. Cause I'm fucking insane. So I did that before. <laughs> so anyways, as far as, uh, if, you if you wanna see some insight into one of those experiments, you can check out the injectable LGD4033 log I did. I will put a card up to the corner and my editor will put it up there. And if they don't, then it's not my fault. Yeah! So as far as the SARMs in question, which one has the least androgenic activity relative to most anabolic activity, uh, milligram for milligram, I guess, you know, we're not going to look at injectable because that changes the profile of the compound significantly when you skip first pass. So we're just going to be looking at traditionally, this is how they were supposed to be ingested as orally. So that is the uh, method of administration we're going to be referring to because it's the most generally applicable. So of these SARMs, you know, there is uh, Austrian, there is S4, there is um, RED140, LGD4033, LGD3303, S23, YK11, I guess, even though it's not a uh, technically a non-steroidal SARM, so it shouldn't really even be lumped into this, but I'm going to put it in there simply because most other people would, you know, lump it into the SARMs category when realistically it's pretty much the same as asking about like fucking trend blown or something, which by the way is actually technically a steroidal SARM, which is why YK11 also is, but anyways, um, what else? Um, you know, there's some ob obscure ones like ACP 105, AC 26, uh, what is it? 262, 526 or some shit, 536 and some other ones too. And no MK677, Carterine, SR9009. Those are not SARM. So we will not be referring to those. Those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. And those are the main ones as far as, uh, I remember. I can't, I don't think there's any other like mainstream ones that I missed in that list. So anyways, as far as the main ones, which is what basically everyone wants to know about, which are the worst, I'll tell you right now, S23 and RAD140 are fucking horrendous for your hair. Brutal, like much worse than even some anabolic steroids, to be honest, like they're very, very rough. So I would avoid those entirely. And I've talked about this many times. And that is literally the SARM that uh, caused Brandon Harding to experience hair loss for the first time. So that is a video I did recently as well. Um, what else? LGD, yeah, 3303, not hair safe, 4033. It's like, maybe like it's okay, but it's definitely not like safe. Frankly, it's not like any of these are safe. Realistically, there's some that are very close, but no, none of them are like at a high enough dose 
you're going to, remember what I said, the lowest effective dose and then above and beyond that, you start to get like satellite interaction with other shit and causing a like side effect profile to just, you know, exponentially ramp up. The same thing happens with SARMs. Like you can literally restore prostate weight in a castrated rodent just by cranking the dose up and you're gonna get like no additional anabolic activity and just crank up the androgenicity over and over and over again until you get back up to baseline prostate weight or, you know, the proxy for potentially hair loss. And obviously it's not exactly how it plays out, but it's how we use, uh, these uh, measurements to assess energetic activity relative to stimulation of muscle tissue growth. So um, as far as what else, YK11, by the way, also is just as bad as, uh, might as well as be as bad as RAD140 S23. It's pretty bad, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pull or whatever foot pull the saying is, a long one. <laughs> um, the Austrian and S4, those are actually the most hair safe ACP is uh, ACP 105 supposedly is actually pretty hair safe too, but I have a uh, very minimal experience with the compound. I don't, I don't necessarily, uh, I didn't really dig into it too much except for my basic uh, evaluation of it back, you know, however many years ago when I first wrote about it, um, AC 26, uh, whatever the fuck also, you know, relatively benign, but also a very ineffective SARM overall. Of the effective mainstream ones, realistically, what you're looking at is Austrian and S4 as the most hair safe SARMs above and beyond everything else. LGD is sort of like a trailing third, but it's like, it's well behind S4. When you look at the hair safety of both Austrian versus S4 now, which is the best one? Honestly, uh, S4 beats out Austrian too. So Austrian is the, you know, the classic uh, golden child, whatever the fuck compound that everyone thinks is the... Uh, you know, the overall best thing. And to be honest, it's one of the, it's pretty harsh on uh, lipids as well as liver enzymes. And it's not exactly, a, I don't think it's the best. I don't think it's overall the best SARM personally. It definitely has its place for some individuals in certain scenarios. And it's uh, very minimally endogenic. Um, however, it is uh, definitely not the easiest on your uh, biomarkers. S4 on the other hand, aside from making you temporary blind, is which is a fucking sketch side effect, by the way, which I made many videos about and I speculate that the half-life is actually much longer than what is uh, otherwise indicated in the, uh, I don't know, bro logs that we have available to us that state it is like, what was it? I think it's commonly stated that's like four hours or something. I did a video dedicated just to this where I broke it down in elaborate detail, but basically it was like multiple days before the uh, my vision returned to normal using this stuff. But anyways, S4, Aside from the vision issue, which is, you know, a fucking sketch side effect, obviously, on biomarkers, it's actually very forgiving. Interestingly enough, you would think something that, uh, you know, causes like night blindness, essentially, <laughs> would be uh, fucking ruin your health markers. But in fact, it is probably the best one I have seen on biomarkers. In addition to that, the hair safety profile is incredible. Like this compound is something that I've seen dosed upwards of 100, 200 milligrams a day. Guys literally fucking blinding themselves <laughs> and using this stuff, but having uh, no issues with their hair and in fact regrowing their hair when they're using this stuff. And this is sort of what uh, led to my experimentation with uh, topical SARMs. I did a giant deep dive video into the potential therapeutic promise of uh, topical SARMs as a means of a more well tolerated like anti-androgen of sorts. If you're interested in that, you should check it out. I'll put up a card in the corner is, uh, I think it's called the therapeutic promise of uh, Topical SARMs or topical SARMs for hair loss prevention or something. Um, that's, a large, that's a huge experimental theory, by the way. Don't take that as set in stone. But on paper, I think it makes sense. And in practical application, it seems to work for some people. Some people have asked me about the reports on it. And there's not a lot of people doing it, obviously. But the some people who have tried it have reported favorable results. And some actually reporting better results than traditional topical antiandrogens, which is you know, wild to hear because this is something I just kind of pulled out of my ass thinking one day I was like, oh, well, it's under 500 Dalton. So like, why can't we just apply on our heads and bind to the AR selectively and get some sort of uh, antagonist effect? Um, and seems like it might actually do that for some people. But anyways, um, back to the oral ingestion. S4 is by far the best one, in my opinion. And that is even at dosages, weekly dosages far exceeding other compounds. So like, for example, if you were going to compare 10 to 15 milligrams of RAD140 per day versus 100 milligrams of S4 per day, 
S4 is still more hair safe in my experience. And by the way, the night blindness side effect seems to kick in around the 50 milligram a day mark. So if you do 100, if you do 100, you're going to be uh, blind as fuck. Just, you know, at nighttime at least. And adjusting to uh, dark rooms and shit. Which is not the nicest thing ever. When you look up in the night sky in the middle of the summer and you see absolutely <laughs> a sheet of fucking black and not one star. It's, uh, you know, you've hit uh, the S4 sides. So, um... Anyways, so S4 is by far the most hair safe SARM. Austrian is second. And um, yeah, that is pretty much it. There's not a whole lot more to dig into it. As far as like people have asked, you know, will finasteride protect from hair loss from SARMs? Will dutasteride? Will topical antiandrogens? Blah, blah, blah. It depends on the context. You have to remember that when SARMs, if they're inherently androgenic, like RID140, for example, not only are you dealing with the crushed SHBG, but above and beyond that, you're also dealing with the high binding affinity of the RID140 competing for AR in the scalp and it's inherent androgenicity. So you are, you know, I guess technically it's competing with uh, DHT and test, but I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you see the results, man. Like anecdotally, how many people have reported just brutal fucking sheds from RID140 Many people at this point, to the point where I have pretty much deemed it something I will not touch. Um, some people really like it, but those are usually individuals who are not prone to hair loss or just don't give a fuck, which is fine. Just shave it, bros are all welcome on the channel too. So anyways, um, yeah, you know, as far as will finasteride and dutasteride help, they'll help in the context of SHBG getting crushed and more DHC being liberated to go fuck your hair up because you'll be inhibiting the 5-alpha reductase conversion from testosterone to DHT and all of that newly liberated testosterone and DHT and testosterone converting into more DHT as well as testosterone being outcompeted for AR resulting in more free-floating testosterone which can 5-alpha reduce to DHT too. You know, the 5-AR inhibition obviously prevents a significant amount of that uh, DHT creation occurring in the first place. So yes, it will help your hair loss prevention. However, if you get to the point where you are literally suppressed down to like zilch almost, no, it makes like almost no difference because you don't actually have any testosterone to convert to DHT to begin with. So it kind of depends on what stage of the cycle you're on, how suppressed you are, what compound you're using with it. And then above and beyond that, the actual, like most people are actually thinking about the SARM itself. Can finasteride and dutasteride do anything to compete with that for the androgen receptor? No, because it just deals with the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. So all you're dealing with is whatever kind of uh, impact the SARM may have on your endocrine profile, which then leads to more DHT or, you know, whatever happens to the DHT through liberation via dropping the binding proteins and whatnot. That's all you're dealing with. You're not actually dealing with the androgen receptor whatsoever. So if you want to deal with the AR and compete with a SARM, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to have to do it with a topical antiandrogen. 5-alpha reductase inhibitor is not going to do shit. So that's where, you know, RE58841 comes into the play. CBO301. And the dosage deployed kind of depends, again, on the SARM being used, how powerful it is, I guess, in layman's terms. And yeah, that is the only way to, uh, if you want to get in the middle of 5-AR, yeah, that helps with the DHC portion. As far as the inherent SARM, its actual mechanism of action being transcribed via binding to AR, the only way you're gonna get in, in front of that is with the topical antiandrogen or some other means of either degrading the androgen receptor in the scalp, which is something I've actually been looking into recently, a selective androgen receptor degraders, which is some next level shit. And uh, you know other things that deal with other uh, cascades that happen after AR binding which are you know less focused on and less understood. And frankly, even I don't really 100% know what the fuck I'm even looking at half the time when I'm looking at some of these downstream cascades, but I just know that certain things that you can get in the middle of can affect the end outcome of miniaturization being you know halted if you are able to get in front of some of the shit that eventually comes from that AR activation to begin with. Cause it's not just like AR activates, boom, hair gone. Like there's a cascade of events and a myriad of different things that cumulatively contribute to this miniaturization process. So um, we just know like where it begins sort of thing. And that's kind of where the, uh, you know, standard treatments have sort of uh, derived from their uh, mechanisms. So anyways, long story short, S4 is the safest, Austrian is the second safest, and that is pretty much it. So thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe. Check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, bitch you, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, if you want to listen on audio instead of burn through your data. Um, if you want to save battery too, because uh, obviously YouTube watching kills your battery way quicker than just listening to a downloaded podcast. 
five star review helps the podcast algorithm so drop one there if you don't mind uh, if you want to support the channel you can check out anything i'm associated with in the video description below my trc clinic as well as gorilla mind nootropic formulas gorilla mode pre-workout formulas i designed myself from scratch and anything else i'm associated with um, newbie diet for uh beginners who don't know how to approach their uh macro and micronutrient allocations and whatnot i uh haven't i've talked about the vertical diet a handful of times in the past but i don't think i've ever mentioned that i actually have like a link down there for anyone who's interested in a like newbie friendly like you know diet 101 kind of thing for ensuring you hit your macros and micros while simultaneously optimizing uh digestion and health overall um, I would recommend trying that to begin with. It's a good starting foundation, which you can then work off of and tweak based on your own genetics and your own individual needs and goals later down the line. But it's the most like newbie friendly thing to kind of like get started if you don't know where to begin. Um, and anything else I'm associated with, video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.